I'm Dr. Sam Fesich, host of the EduMagic Podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions are those of each individual host. You can find more great education podcasts by visiting our website, edupodcastnetwork.com. Get ready because the learning begins in three, two, one. to episode 88 of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast, your source for the latest Google for Education news, tips, tricks, and ideas you can use in class tomorrow. I'm Casey Bell from Shake Up Learning. And I'm Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook. And in today's episode, it is that fantastic end of the year time. And we're going to talk about what we can do with our Google Classroom at the end of the year. Getting things organized, getting things... It's kind of like at the end of the year when you box things up and you get everything all all organized and ready for the summer. We're going to do that with your Google Classroom. And of course, we've got some Google news and updates to throw in. We've got some blog posts to share and some messages from the tribe, all of the things that you love from the Google Teacher Tribe. So, Casey, you ready to do this? Let's go. It's time to take a look at the Google News and updates. And, you know, this week we have sort of slowed down, I think, a little bit from all of the big announcements we had at at I.O. So we've got a few interesting takes to share with you. The first one I want to give you is actually from the Keyword blog, and it's called Three New Machine Learning Courses. And it really brought to my attention. I'm like, ooh, what is this? And is it free? So machine learning, you know, is is a, a way that machines begin to <laughs> learn. <laughs> Can right. I give you a bit more blonde yep, definition? There you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> but in, in terms, of it's it's trying to predict the things that you want, that you want to do, that you tasks that you want to complete. And machine learning is now built into so many of the apps that we use including things like docs and slides, the explore tool is actually making use of, of machine learning. So what is interesting about this is there are three new courses and they say that, um, These are online courses that they have designed to help researchers, developers, and students. Now keep in mind, I think they are talking more about students of the machine learning (laughs) adult students kind of thing. But what I think is useful is that these three courses, one, can teach us as teachers more about this high-tech world that we're living in. And if you geek out over the stuff like I do, (laughs) or I also think these would be fantastic to share maybe with some of your high school students or maybe even some of your graduating seniors who may be looking to go into these fields. So there is a class on clustering. There is a class on recommendation systems and testing and debugging. So I did open one up. I opened up the clustering course. This is using Google's course builder, it looks like to me. And so you can see the outline. You can see all of the curriculum right there at your fingertips. So some of the objectives, you know, are listed there. You can jump to a section. If you just want to take a look at this, this is way above my knowledge base. So just looking at this, I probably need a little bit of a a prerequisite before I'm allowed to enter this course, but it looks very interesting and interesting enough to share with you and maybe some of your students who are looking at going into some of these fields. Yeah. And it's so cool that that really sort of detailed high level stuff like that is available for free. And in in a field like machine learning, where you know that the demand is going to be high, this is this could be like the entry point that students could get um, going into college that could really potentially change their lives, you know, like really open up some career fields. So um, that's 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 really a pretty cool thing. The next thing that we've got is about spreadsheets. Now, if you are a spreadsheet lover, Casey and I were just talking off air about how that is probably, although we use them a a decent amount, we are not your like high level spreadsheet people. (laughs) But um, there is a, a post in the keyword blog called 
ask a expert what is so interesting about spreadsheets. And they sit down with the product manager for Google Sheets. And they just kind of like dig into some things about spreadsheets in general. Like how did spreadsheets and computers first meet? Because spreadsheets were like paper sheets that spread out, right? And he even talks about how, um, you know, spreadsheets were one of the reasons he says it was one of the first killer apps on the personal computer, like software so popular that it becomes one of the main reasons people buy a computer. And they talk, they talk about how spreadsheets are being used today and some of the different things that people do. And they even dig into the future of spreadsheets and about how, um, you know, like artificial intelligence and some of that same machine learning are changing how we use spreadsheets and what we can do with them. Um, he talks about how spreadsheets really democratize data analysis, how it used to be expensive and time consuming and hard to do data analysis before, but now anybody can do it. So if you're all about spreadsheets and want to dig into a little bit of that, it is kind of an interesting article. So maybe you go check it out. And you know, I I may not be the spreadsheet geek, but I use it every single day. Yeah. I use spreadsheets every single day. And when we live in a data-driven world, and especially now as teachers, you are expected to become a, a data analyst. Mm -hmm. You really need to spend some time getting to know sheets. Even yeah. if you are not at a super high level, everyone needs to know and understand the value of that. And you know what I like about that article too is because we need to get students using sheets. And when they ask us, how in the world am I ever going to use this in the real world? That article. I think just answered that question. Yep. Preach so, it, sister. Preach uh, it. Oh, amen. Here we go. Okay. So moving on, let's talk about money. How about money? Y'all need money? Everybody <laughs> needs the money for their classroom. So um, Google.org has actually been supporting the Donors Choose projects for, for many years now. And to date, they have provided over $25 million to support classrooms on DonorsChoose.org. I'm sure many of our listeners have funded some of their favorite projects and devices in their classroom using donors choose because we all know frankly there's just not enough to go around and sometimes we have to work really hard to get some of the things that we want for our classrooms so this post here is actually called affirming the identities of teachers and students in the classroom and what they are talking about is they are getting a closer look from two teachers who have used donors choose and the i see me campaign and that's a a new effort to celebrate the identities of teachers and students in their classrooms. So, you know, really taking a closer look at not only these teachers, but the public school um, perspective and looking at some of the things that we can do to help support our, our teachers and help you in your classroom. So you can also access some free inclusive classroom resources and ideas that they have posted in the teacher center. By the way, if you didn't know this existed, Google for Education does have what they call the Teacher Center, and there's free training there, including a whole section of resources, which, um, by the way, Google Teacher Tribe is one of those resources. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, so here you can find books for inclusive classrooms. You can find those Chrome accessibility features. You can find all kinds of really cool tips and features. So this is actually a big takeaway and big reminder because I haven't actually looked at this in a long time. So there are tons of resources that have now been added into the teacher center there. So, of course, you know, coming back and we're all thinking already about the next school year and the things that you need and the things that you want. So um, this can help support you. And, of course, using the combination of donor shoes and Google.org to get there. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Great resources there. Let's move on to the last piece of the news and updates and it has to do with Carmen San Diego. We were so excited in March when we found out that Carmen San Diego was on Google Earth. And apparently, according to this article, lots and lots of people flocked to Google Earth to play the Carmen San Diego game. If you're not familiar with where in the world is Carmen San Diego, it was a personal computer game and a classic. Um, it was a huge part of my childhood. And um, so now we find out that um, Google has teamed up with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt um, to create yet another Carmen San Diego game. This one, we're, we're trying to help. Carmen recover Tutankhamun's mask. 
And so there is a new game out there. Uh, it says look for the special edition Pegman icon in Google Earth for Chrome, Android, and iOS if you want to go play that game. I haven't gotten a chance to play it yet, but in this post, there is a what looks like, it's almost like a movie trailer, I think, for this game. And um, it, sh- it should be out there waiting for you. So um, if this sounds like something interesting to you, we've got a link to that and to all of the things that we've just talked about in the news and updates at our show notes at Google teachertribe.com slash 88. All right, Tribe, we're going to be talking today about a topic that we know is near and dear to so many of your hearts, and that is Google Classroom. And since it is the end of the school year, we're starting to wind down a little bit. And I know Casey and I hear this question and see it on social media an awful lot of, what do I do with my Google Classroom now that the school year is coming to a close? You know, we want to make sure that things are organized, that things are ready to go for the next year and everything. And um, so there, there are a handful of things that we can do here at the end of the school year to make sure that Google Classroom is set and ready to go. Now, the nice thing about Google Classroom, of course, is that it is very user-friendly, and it's pretty intuitive. And unlike a lot of other learning management systems, they've got all sorts of bells and whistles and different things that you can do. Google Classroom is pretty streamlined. I mean, it was basically created to assign work, collect work, grade work, and return work. And so with that, thankfully, there aren't a whole lot of moving parts. And so when it comes to... um When it comes to getting your Google Classroom all squared away at the end of the year or even prepared for the next year, there just aren't a ton of things that you've got to do. But I think there there are a handful of them that that we can suggest. And one of them, let's start with something that is hopefully pretty uh, self-explanatory and expected, but we'll still mention it, is that if you have student work that's still out there, um, you know, it's it's generally a good idea to go back through and grade all of that work and return all of that work back to students. There's there's several reasons that that's useful. One of which is that, of course, whenever students turn work into you, that um, it's transferred over to you as the teacher. And so if we want to make sure that students have access to all of that, then being able to return all of that work is good. And plus it does update, you know, that, that gives us a, a chance to update in the grade book. And so everything kind of gets tied up and neatly organized when students get all of that stuff back. So that's, that's definitely one step that you can take to wrap up your Google Classroom at the end of the year. Yes. And this is definitely something you want to do before you start archiving. You want to clean up the current classes. So if you haven't already begun this process. Of course, some of you may still be giving assignments, so you're 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 waiting for it. I know many of you will not get out until June, but go to your your three-line menu, go to your to-do list and review what you have going on. So, you know, look at what what assignments may still be needing to be returned or even graded. Right? Um I've never forgotten to grade anything <laughs> in my life. Have you? No, Matt? absolutely not. <laughs> No, no, <laughs> we're real here, folks. This is this is reality, right? So be sure that you go in and take a look at that. And, you know, sometimes you may even want to take a look at some students that are part of that class and even remove them or unenroll them from your classes. Um, this may not seem something that's completely obvious, but um, you could possibly have students who are sharing information about classes. So especially in secondary, when you have some mixed groups of different grade levels and kids are taking classes at different times or possibly the whole um, sibling thing where they're sharing some information and getting into classes in the next year. So you may want to take a look at that people tab and see what students are still part of the class and if any of them really didn't belong anymore. Um, you can also take a look at that. That's completely optional. But the the other thing before you really get into cleaning things up, you may want to take a look 
at your Google Drive, right? So the connection between Google Classroom and Google Drive is amazing. But Matt, I don't know about you, but I find that teachers tend to be some of the most organized people I've ever met in my life. Oh, yes. <laughs> Some of them, <laughs> um, some uh, uh, some of you tend to obsess over <laughs> the cleanliness. Um, some some Marie Kondo uh, of our tidying up of Google Drive. So, um, just a bit of caution before you do that. Okay, so uh, yes, go into your drive. Go find that Google Classroom folder, but do not delete it. I repeat, do not delete the Google Classroom folder. It's really hard to get it back, that main folder. However, if the folders within there are all from old classes, you don't need that stuff anymore. Consider creating some new folders in Drive outside of that and, you know, maybe saving some of the exemplary work. You can create a new folder just for that or the things that you just want to keep. Um, maybe you've revised some things throughout the year, but, you know, I would just want to give you a word of caution to be very careful about what you clean up. I know for me, like just creating some of those big general folders in my Drive of the school year, you know, 2018, 2019. And then within that, you might have some subfolders for your different subject areas or your different class periods and just sort of migrating some stuff over just to clean that up. And I know teachers tend to want to probably clean up a little more than they should. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with Drive, I always tell people you can always find stuff like don't get delete happy just mm -hmm. move things around a bit. Mm -hmm. So um, just just take a look at it. Be cautious about what you're doing and think very carefully about how you want to organize things and things you may want to access next year. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. It's like <laughs> you talked about Marie Kondo. I think if she saw my Google Drive, you know, she talks about how messes make her happy because it's an opportunity for tidiness and happiness. I would make Marie Kondo pretty doggone happy if she got to look at my Google Drive because it is a <laughs> hot mess, folks. Um, but I've also found in my own drive that I have so much more success searching for things than sticking them into folders and organizing in that way. So, you know, maybe that's... Ain't that the right? truth. Yeah, exactly. It, it saves you time in the <laughs> long run, I think. So, so yeah, as far as that goes, I'm, I'm totally with Casey on this one that... Only so much, it's like at some point you have diminishing returns on your cleaning up of your drive. And eventually at some point it becomes because you want it to look a certain way and not because it's a productivity feature anymore. So if you want to be more productive, there's a certain amount of organizing that you can do. But I think you got to ask yourself the question of, is it going to make me faster better, more efficient in the end? Or am I really just doing this because it's my, you know, compulsive nature to, to tidy things up? So, <laughs> well, and the other thing too, is many people don't realize or remember the fact that you have unlimited storage right. in your Google for education uh, account. So, and even if you have a personal account, just FYI, Google file types don't count against that either. So you have tons of space. So don't let that old mentality of, I got to clean it up because I'm going to run out of room. My computer's going to crash. That's the beauty of cloud computing and saving things there. So um, I, I probably hoard things more than I should, but I always want to come back to it. Somebody's always asking me for something, that parent email, that newsletter that went out last year that had some tip in it. So I'm very much a fan of keeping things. And yeah. yes, like Matt said, the, the search saves me every mm -hmm. time. Yep. Yep. Totally, totally agree there. Now, as we're talking about cleaning things up and what to delete and what not to delete, let me give you a suggestion. Uh, those class calendars that you've got in your Google Calendar, if Google Calendar is an important part of your life and if your class, your Google Classroom calendars, you know, the ones that are tied to your Google Classroom, if they are in that account of the Google Calendar that you use regularly, you probably want to go in and delete those class calendars. See, for me, I've got a couple of, <laughs> this is an understatement here. I have a couple of Google accounts 
Surprise. Casey, do you have more than a couple Google accounts? Maybe it yeah, doesn't. <laughs> right? Exactly. I think I'm being modest when I say just a couple. But there, there, there's really two of them that I work off of the most. I have my personal Gmail account and then I have my um, I have my ditch that textbook um, Google account, which is kind of like my teacher account, so to speak. And so if you're if you're working off of a teacher account and a personal account and your Google Calendar, the one that you go off of daily, if you use Google Calendar daily. Um, if that happens to be on the same account as your Google Classroom calendars, you might want to go in and delete those Google Classroom calendars just to eliminate the, the clutter. And so, you know, that's, that's pretty easy to do to go in and to delete those calendars, especially if you're in the web interface and you go over on the left hand sidebar. It's pretty easy to delete those. Um, if you don't see those Google Classroom calendar events, in your regular one, it may not be that big of a deal and you may not have to go in and do that. But as far as to keep your um, daily use Google Calendar kind of like tight and neat and organized uh, so that it makes you efficient, that really might be a good idea. I do want to add one quick note about calendar as well. So a lot of teachers may be looking at trying to set up their assignments in the same way the next year. Hey, when did I assign what? So maybe before you decide to delete, which by the way, you have those little check boxes when you're on your calendar page where you can turn calendars on and off so that you don't have to see all of those classes at once. But you may want to go ahead and just uncheck everything and check one of your classes or or if you only have one class, check that class and take a look at a different view. So I I default to the month view. That's kind of how I operate. But there's also something called the schedule view. And the schedule view is going to just give you that list day by day. So if you're looking at that for your classes, that's actually going to show you exactly what you assigned on what or not assigned, what was due on what day. So you don't see, um, I wish it did give you those assignment dates, but that is something that you may also want to print because so if you're looking at that schedule, you could also print that. And by the way, printing does not necessarily mean paper. So printing to a PDF or printing to save to Google Drive would also allow you to save that. So if you just needed that quick snapshot, that is something that you could save just to reference before you start the next school year. So just thought I would mention that and really just kind of came to me as I was playing around on my calendar and thinking about this. So one other thing I do want to mention going back to Google Drive, (laughs) this is really just my general philosophy and teaching teachers about Google Drive. When you click on shared with me, that is a filter. Okay. Shared with me is not yours. That's kind of defeats the whole purpose of what it's called. These are other people's files that have been shared with you, okay? If you begin deleting things and trying to clean up the shared with me, you are inviting a disaster. I I will just say it. Every time a teacher tells me that they, you know, that they've started cleaning up shared with me, I'm like, no, stop right now. Just accept that the shared with me is going to be a hot mess. But you never know when you're going to need to come back and access that again. You should still be able to find it when you search. But um, best scenario, just accept that shared with me is just the special filter that's showing you documents that other people have shared with you. Now, you can use that add to drive thing and organize it into a folder if that's what you need to make yourself compulsively happy. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> so um, just a quick note about that, because um, you will probably see some things from students in that shared with me as well. Yep. I think that's a really, really good point. Now, uh, one more quick thing to touch on, and I think that this goes, this obviously goes with working with Google Classroom um, at the end of the year or just in general, but I think it also goes just as a general practice for us as educators it is not a bad idea at the end of the year to look back on your Google Classroom practices, like what it is that you've been doing, what has succeeded, what has frustrated you, and to think about what works and what doesn't and try to improve on it. Um, you know, I think so often it's easy for us to get to the end of a day or a week or a semester or a year and to just move on to the next thing. But it's a really good idea to stop 
and reflect and think about what was good and what you can improve on. And what's great about that also is that if you're looking at your use of Google Classroom and you've got those frustrations or those clunky things that just aren't working, collaboration is a wonderful thing. So it could be just as simple as hopping onto Twitter and going to the Google EDU or the GT Tribe hashtag, you know, for Google Teacher Tribe and throw in a question out there. Hey, I struggled with this this year. Is there, does anybody have any suggestions or a workaround or whatever? And so by doing that and inviting other people to join you in your journey, now all of a sudden you're not going at it by yourself. You know, there's that, that old saying that um, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. But if you want to go far, go together. And so I think if we want to, that, that's the end goal, right, is to, is to go far and is to improve over time. That's when we go together. And that's why this Google Teacher Tribe is here for you, even throughout the summer, out on Twitter, um, and that we don't have to do this alone. So maybe take a little bit of time and look back over those practices and see what you'd like to improve and then throw it out to someone and say, hey, what do you, what do you think? Is there a better way to do that? Because obviously two heads are better than one. Absolutely. Very good points. And, you know, too, this is a good time to think about the types of assignments that you were giving, right. like Matt was mentioning. Are you truly taking advantage of the collaboration? Um, anytime anyone asks me why in the world would I want to go Google, collaboration is number one. That is the number one selling point. And if you're not doing that, you're missing mm-hmm. the boat. If you're just using Google because that's what your school is using and you're still uploading all your worksheets, Lord help me if one more teacher asks me how to get their worksheet into <laughs> Google Classroom. I might just scream. So um, this is this is not what it's about. It's a mindset shift to think about your, about teaching and learning in different ways. And that's what I like about G Suite for Education is it does help us support the principles that we want to see in the classroom and engaging students in different ways and using technology to support the learning and not just as that substitution for what we used to do on paper. So I'll step down off of my soapbox now and mention one more quick tip. So as you are cleaning up and you're beginning to think of next year, one tip that you may want to try is to set up a Google Classroom class template. So we now have the ability when you're on that main classroom.google.com page where you see all the cards for your classes. And actually, I think we kind of skipped over the archiving part. We didn't talk about that, but this is also where you archive. So those three dots next to the card will give you the option to archive a class. And so that's why I like archiving. It just, it just, it's there and you can bring it back if you need to, because you can go back to your menu and always see your archived classes. But when you're on that homepage, you also have the ability to copy a class. So this means that you can take the things that you've learned, set up the class that's sort of your ideal, you know, your assignments, how the order that they're in, how did you number them, all those tips that we've shared along the way. And you can create a copy that serves as your template. And so each year you can just improve and make a copy. So just one quick tip. I've got a link in the show notes, of course, on how to do that as well. But I think there are just so many ways that we all can use Google it, that in a way that fits our own personality. Everybody who's listening, I'm like, no, Casey, that's not how I do it. But that's what's great is we have choice and we have so many different ways that we can use these things to support our kids. And we've got some additional resources in the show notes for you. I've even plugged in some of Alice Keeler's posts on cleaning up Google Classrooms. So if you're looking for some of those step-by-step uh, instructions, we've got those there for you in our show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 88. This is Chris Nessie, founder of the Education Podcast Network, ISTE 2019 is right around the corner, and we're hosting an Education Podcast Network meetup. Come out on Sunday, June 23rd at 6 p.m. at Pat's King of Steaks and meet all your favorite Education Podcast Network podcasters and connect with other listeners. We're going to have an old-fashioned cheesesteak challenge. We're going to eat at Pat's, we're going to eat at Geno's, we're going to have a good time, talk podcasting, and we'd love to see you there. Come out on June 23rd at 6 p.m. if you're going to be in Philly for ISTE 2019. 
I look forward to seeing you there. Now, back to the podcast. There's a letter in your mailbox. Hey, you know what? This is all your mail. Hey, maybe I'll give you a call sometime. You've got mail. Hey, Matt, guess what time it is? I think it's mailbag time. Mailbag time. Are you jumping? Are you jumping jumping into into the the mailbag? (laughs) Here we go. So our first question here comes to us from KD Mucci. So KD says that she's trying to access Jamboard, but access is denied and to contact her admin. So apparently she's getting some pushback and she wants to know if there's any reason to not grant access and that her admin doesn't understand the platform and thinks that it it's asking to purchase an actual Jamboard device. Uh, and she says from the podcast, it sounds like Jamboard is just like Padlet, but with G Suite. Help. Okay. So let's set some some ground uh, ground rules here. First of all, um, I, I get on another soapbox when it comes to the technical admins who may or may not understand the instructional implications for things. So um, that that makes me makes me want to talk to these people and <laughs> and let them know how awesome Jamboard is. So Jamboard is a free web based application. It is also a Jamboard device, but you do not have to buy the device anymore. Um, It started sort of kicked off with the device, but now we have the web-based version that works on, I think, just about any device now. And it it works particularly well on touchscreens, but you don't have to have touchscreens. So in Jamboard, let me tell you, way, way more than what Padlet can do. So Padlet's just like a bunch of sticky notes and you can add different attachments and things, but Jamboard is much more collaborative. And it really is like a collaborative whiteboard that is really, to me, being built up by Google. I think they're really investing a lot of time and energy to make this an awesome platform. And I think right now it's sort of taking off in the business world and we're suddenly beginning to see some of the implications for using it in education and it is part of G Suite for education. So they can turn it on and no, they don't have to pay anything extra. But, you know, sometimes I, I'm going to irritate some people when I say this, but sometimes I think people just tell teachers something to keep from having an argument. So, you know, that they just may say it's not available or you have to pay for it when either they don't know or they don't want to mess with it or whatever the reason is. So um, this is something that you may want to play with in your personal account, get familiar with it so that you have an argument so that you can share the instructional strategies that this is going to help support in your classroom. Um, And let's not forget those four C's that are also going to come into play when you use a tool like this in your classroom. So there are tons of people who are already doing this as well. I'm sure a quick Google search um, would let you see some of that. I know Kim Matina, who has been on the podcast earlier, she's actually been doing a lot with Jamboard. So I'm sure she would be a great connection for you as well. Um, But thank you for the question. I think this brings up not only good questions about Jamboard, but just about policies in general and sometimes how we have to kind of fight what we feel is the best for our students. So thanks for that, KD. Uh, We also got a message from Dana Clement from Texas, and uh, she has a really interesting question that I would love to hear uh, some some folks from the tribe chime in on. So take it away, Dana. Hey, Matt and Casey. This is Dana Clement coming from North Texas. And I wanted to shout you guys out because I've been a longtime listener of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. And because of you guys, I just got my Google Trainer certification. So I'm excited to help teachers see the power of G Suite in the wonderful Google tools. With that, I also want my students to be set up for success. I teach eighth grade at a small school district that when they go to high school, basically go a building over. So they will have had their same Google Drive since kindergarten. I want to train my eighth graders to be successful using G Suite and staying organized and on top of their game going into high school. So with the last two weeks of school left, What I want to do is streamline everything for them. So my question is this. If you were going to set eighth graders up for success in high school, what key features in G Suite or extensions or just organizational tips and tricks would you do to help them 
to be set up for success before going on to high school next year. I have my list, but I'm anxious to hear yours. And I just would love to set them up to go on to high school, rocking and rolling. Thanks a lot, y'all. Bye. I love that Dana is thinking about this. How can we set eighth graders up for success in high school? Like what are the key features, extensions, organizational tips and tricks and all that? I know that Casey and I have a mountain of things that we could suggest, but I would love to be able to throw this out to the tribe. So if you had eighth graders who are getting ready to go into high school and you've got to, <laughs> if you're a middle school teacher and you've got to turn those eighth graders over to the high school, you know, let, let them go. Um, what are the things that you would give them to set them up for success? Like Dana said, any key features, extensions, organizational tips, tricks, any of that stuff. Now, this could potentially play very well into our episode for next week. So next week, we're going to be doing our regular tips from the tribe episode. We try to do these about once a semester, and that's where we basically turn the entire episode over to you. So if you have a Google tip or trick related to anything within the G Suite that you think would be useful to the tribe, definitely go to googleteachertribe.com and leave us a message on the feedback page. And we're going to be featuring a whole bunch of those. And if you're looking for things to say, you know, we could even use Dana's question as a prompt for that. So it could be what tip or trick do you have for teachers, but it could also be what tip or trick do you have for students to set them up for success with G Suite 2. I think those two would fit very, very well together. So we're really interested to see what the tribe has to say about this. This could, this question could potentially prompt an entire episode of its own of the Google Teacher Tribe, I think. So, um, we're super, super excited, super excited to hear what you all have to say and to get the tips from the tribe. So definitely, definitely go, go leave us a message. All right, Tribe, we got a couple of blog posts to point you to, and then we're going to wrap this episode up. And I've got one that I was I was really excited about when I saw this on Twitter, so much so that I asked the person sharing it to write a guest post for the Ditch That Textbook blog. And so this person is Sarah Jacobs. She's an educator in California, and she created this gorgeous, she calls it a mosaic with Google Drawings. Basically, she took a picture and was able to put uh, put all of these little polyline shapes all over it and created this mosaic. It almost looks like a tile or kind of like a stained glass type of thing. She did it within Google Drawings, and um, it is amazing. And so she wrote us a guest blog post kind of uh, giving us the step-by-step of how to create those and how you could even potentially use them in the classroom. She used them to get her students connected to a, uh, a novel that they were reading. So um, if you haven't seen this already, uh, there's an example of it in our show notes, googleteachertribe.com slash 88, if you want to go check it out. So that's, that's a fun thing. I also wanted to let you know that my um, online course called Tech to Learn, where I lay out a lot of the the key ways that you can really amplify learning with technology, the stuff that really works. Um, I've got this uh, discount going through the end of May where you can get the course for 50% off. I only do this a couple of times a year. So um, through the end of May, that um, course is going to be discounted. So uh, you can do a Google search just for tech to learn, and that should find it for you. Or, of course, you can head to the show notes to find a link to it as well. So I'm loving this mosaic art. In fact, the image that you have added to the show notes, it's kind of blowing my mind. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I really love this idea. And I love that it's coming from a teacher who's integrating art in a classroom that's not an art classroom, right? right Did exactly. I understand that right? So, you know, of course we talk STEAM and get, getting that A in there. So um, I love it. I think it's amazing. Yeah. I have a couple of, of links that I want to share today. I just released a podcast. Uh, I guess I could say it was last week. <laughs> when you're listening to this, it would have been last week. It's episode 12 of the Shake Up Learning Show. And I talk about how to get credit for listening to podcasts just like this one. So if you have ever wondered, hey, how can I get 
my principal or my administrator to help me get credit for all this time that I spend outside of the classroom learning and getting, because I know tons of people listen to the Google Teacher Tribe and have used these things in their classroom. And you know what? You should get credit. So I share some ideas on ways that this can happen and some ways that some other schools are making this happen. So if it's something you're interested in, maybe something that you can use as a leader, go check it out, how to get credit for listening to podcasts. And I wanted to mention, so the time this episode comes out on May 20th, which means tomorrow, May 21st is when the Google certification courses open. So I have three courses to help you reach your goals of becoming a Google certified educator level one level two or trainer. They only open twice a year and the enrollment window is only two weeks. So you have from now until June 4th to enroll. So you can go to getgooglecertified.com to learn more. if everyone realizes this, but we're not only getting closer to our 100th episode, which will actually happen in season four, but we're also getting really close to a million downloads. What? And that's something that I want to celebrate. So um, Matt and I will be keeping an eye on that. And who knows, maybe over the summer, we'll have enough listeners that we, we might actually hit it over the summer, but I think it's going to happen probably in the fall, but really, really excited. We only have one more episode left of the Google Teacher Tribe, and that one's all about you. So as Matt mentioned earlier, leave us those speak pipe messages, share your favorite tips, tricks, lesson ideas. We want your best stuff. Those are my favorite episodes, and I think those are some of the most popular episodes Mm -hmm. in the entire catalog. So please, please, please participate. Yes, absolutely. We are so looking forward to hearing those. So leave us some messages and we will pull them together into an episode for next week. So until then, thanks again for listening to the Google Teacher Tribe and we will see you on the next episode. Bye, y'all. Thanks for listening to the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Keep up with every new episode by subscribing on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, and by visiting googleteachertribe.com. Get in on the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag GTTribe. Until next time, keep harnessing the G Suite power. And may the Googles be with you. I'm just going to call it that. Okay, sorry, Chris. Um, oh, wait, and now my phone's going off. It's telling me it's time to work out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>